Hi, I'm Patricia Shanks, and this is Studio Shanks Sundays Live at 5. Keep watching. I can't tell you how excited I am to talk with my guest today, and I'm not even going to give you his name until I tell you all of the wonderful things that he's done and is doing. You know, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed at this quality, and I have a list here that I must cheat and look at because it's so long. This gentleman has a, a Bachelor of Music and Voice Performance from Northern Arizona University and Master of Music and Choral Conducting and a Doctor uh, of music arts, musical arts and choral conducting from the University of Miami. He sings with, among other groups, I'm sure, the Los Angeles Master Chorale, Conspirari, which is a Grammy-winning ensemble, Bach Collegium, I think it's a San Diego group, I'm not uh, ultra familiar, um, Golden Bridge, Tesserae, and Prism, and I think there are probably some other groups. So we have that to start with. He has also sung with Seraphic Fire, which is interesting, I'd like to learn about that, an early and newly composed music uh, ensemble. The Santa Fe Desert Chorale, where he was also assistant conductor. Phoenix Chorale, Vox Humana, Phoenix Box Choir, Bach Choir, and I think I'm missing some on the list. Um, and one of the very impressive uh, accomplishments and credits that I'd like to speak with the gentleman about is his solo engagement uh, in singing the Schubert Mass in E with the New World Symphony under Michael Tilson Thomas. He has been a soloist. Are you ready yet? Are, can't you wait for this gentleman's name? He has been a soloist for Los Angeles Master Chorale, Flagstaff Symphony, Les Surprises Baroque, pardon my French, Baroque Festival, Festival Corona Del Mar, Early Music Hawaii, American Bach Series, Miami Bach Society, Victoria Bach Festival, and the Master Chorale of South Florida. And I need to take a singer's breath after all of that. So th that's just to start with. And I'm going to give you a couple of uh, credits, a couple of his reviews, because I probably will forget to mention these. The Orange County Register has said he has he sings feathery light acrobatics. I'd like to know what pieces that was that was on. Uh, the Miami Herald says unearthly beauty. That one I really would like to have explained. <laughs> Um, and, and he sings on movie soundtracks. So I'm finally, finally going to let this gentleman speak. He is uh, the, uh, did, did I mention he's the chair of the Department of Music and Professor of Vocal Music at Irvine Valley College in Irvine, California. And his name is Dr. Matthew Tressler. Hi, Matt. Hi, Patricia. Thanks for having me with you today. Oh, my goodness. I thank you for, for, accepting this invitation because I, you're just phenomenal and I'm sure with all of these things you have no time. I don't know how you do it all. Teaching alone, you know, just, just handling the department and teaching alone. All the teachers who might watch this know what, what that's all about. That's really time consuming. So you can jump in and start anywhere. I'd like to talk about your singing career before we even get anywhere to your teaching, because okay. it's so phenomenal. Well, I, I feel very fortunate to be a singer in this current time and place. Uh, you know, the United States in the last 20 years has seen a real just explosion of professional choral music. Used to be there weren't that many professional choirs, and, and using that definition is, is choirs of paid professional singers. And there's just, as I said, been this real renaissance of, of this type of experience. And when I finished college, I graduated with a performance degree and I intended to go to graduate school and, and pursue opera. But I auditioned for the Phoenix Bach Choir, which is now called the Phoenix Chorale. And that group has been around for a long, long time. And it was professional choir. And it was my first professional job right out of college and loved it. Choral music has always been the thing that drew me to singing more than anything else. I decided to sort of pursue solo voice and opera when I was in college because really I was successful at it and I enjoyed doing it. But choral music was really what drew me to music. I played the piano and I played in band all through high school and 
and in, even in college, but but choral music was really where my my in, true interest was. It's it's what just made me excited. So when I had the opportunity to sing really high level choral music and to learn all of this repertoire in such a short amount of time, sitting shoulder to shoulder with such great musicians, it was a really neat thing for me. And as I said, it's a time when these opportunities just started expanding. So. I sang with them for eight years while I lived in Phoenix still, teaching high school, taught high school choir in, in Gilbert, Arizona. And uh, then I auditioned for the Santa Fe Desert Chorale, and that's a professional choir that has also been around for quite a long time. And that's a seasonal group. So they only meet during the summers, about six to eight weeks. And that group does, it really depends on the summer, but sometimes six or seven different programs of music which means you get to learn a lot of music and a lot of styles. Uh, some of them were commissions. Some of them were sort of rediscovered music. We sang music from the colonial Americas, uh, some you know Baroque Mexican music, very, very interesting times in, in Santa Fe. And I spent 20 really wonderful summers there. I moved to Miami to go to graduate school and this new group, Seraphic Fire, was starting. I, I just heard you kind of mention that idea about new and old music. That group was started in, I think about 2002, and the idea was to perform Renaissance, Baroque, really earlier music, but at the same time commission new works. And so in those early days, we did, uh, for instance, the Victoria Requiem of 1608, I think, as well as um, the a, a new piece based on uh, the uh, first-hand accounts of Hiroshima. You know, that was a brand new piece of music. And so this sort of, that was their mission, was to write new music and sort of rediscover older music. Uh, it was a really great group, and they've been nominated for several Grammys, very successful, continuing group, um, and that's a group where people come from around the country. Same with Conspirari. I started singing with them uh, about 2003, and that group is also singers that come from around the country, and the conductor, Craig Hella Johnson, was studying in Germany and saw where in Germany, when they got together a group, they would all get on their trains from different cities and come to one place and rehearse and perform. And he thought, well, let's try that model in the US. Of course, much bigger, we don't have the rail system. So people flew in. And that's kind of how Conspirari became a national ensemble. And then that model started taking hold in other places. And so that's what Seraphic Fire did. There's a group in Tucson I sing with time to time called True Concord. Same thing, um, the Spire Ensemble in Kansas City. There's and, um, Skylark in Atlanta, I don't sing with them, but there's some really, really fine professional choirs around the country where people just come in for one week at a time as a project. So you get music ahead of time, prepare your music, you know, all your notes and rhythms, and then you spend that week, you know, really finding the music and finding the ensemble and coming together. And it's, it's a really great thing. And then since moving here, I, I joined the LA Master Chorale, uh, and that's a, a different experience altogether because it's a large choir, but sometimes a small choir. I've sung in groups as small as under 20 with that group. We did a concert of um, music from the Notre Dame School, Leonana Peritan, at the Getty because they had windows from that time period that they were restoring. It was a really neat connection, the way they've created that program. And then, of course, we also sing things like Mahler 8. So it's a wonderful opportunity to be here to, to perform with these musicians. So much varied repertoire. Or Frank Zappa, we've performed with the LA Master Crowd. You know, just a little bit of everything. So it's, it's, it's just exciting. a wonderful time to be a singer. Yeah, it's also exciting. And, and it says, you know, if you if you have some talent and have some skills and, you know, it's not just about talent and skill, but it's about training and it's about really being dedicated to your work. Um, it can take you all over the world singing, singing in, in, a, in a group and you meet friends and and make make um, friends and acquaintances with people that last a lifetime. And and it's history. It's living history and travel and and so exciting but it doesn't just happen you know you have to you have to have some something you know you have to have some chops <laughs> <laughs> and and do some work so so tell me um you know because i'm curious you you said you played piano and instruments and things and in, in in high school when did you first get the singing bug hmm Probably just when I was a child, singing in church, um, singing and staying over at my grandma's house. Uh, I auditioned for some community theater things when I was young. And our high school, there was only one in our city at the time, was doing Oliver when I was in the fifth grade. And they came to the elementary school and auditioned children. And so I was a pickpocket. And then after that, I even through middle school, I would sing with the high school musicals. It was just something I really enjoyed when I was young. And so when I was in high school, I already just knew this is what I want to do. I want to be a choir teacher and I want to go to this one school. And it just kind of seemed the direction was really plain and clear to me. I guess That's I'm fortunate great. in that way. 
yeah, thank goodness for those school programs and community programs. And we have fewer and fewer of the community programs. So the school programs, you know, everybody needs to listen and pay attention. The schools, music in the schools is so important because if you're not the football player or the basketball player or the baseball player, you have to, you know, you have to do what you love to do. And you won't find it if that if that music opportunity isn't there. You won't know, you know, yeah, yeah. so. I completely agree. And and not only a school and a, a, a district that values arts and arts education, but a community that does as well. That Gilbert Fine Arts Association, as it was called, where I did those town musicals, they used to hold a, a scholarship um, competition each year and they would give out scholarship money to students going forward in music. Just, you know, a community that really valued development in the arts. Right. And and yeah, it's very important. And you learned so it was it uh, at that point or in school where you learned to read music because I know I didn't want to talk initially about education I want to talk about your career but your career is only your career in part because you learned this you had the skills you learned to read music and so how did that come about was that in in high school or no, you're absolutely right uh, we learned just basic notation in elementary school but I began piano lessons at the age of eight and that's probably where I truly learned to read music. Um, but I played uh, clarinet in elementary and middle school and then tuba in high school, so both clefs, but I was already okay. reading those in piano. And then through high school, you know, we did sight reading. In fact, to be part of the all-state choir in Arizona and even the regional honor choirs, you had to, 60% of your score was your solo, but 40% was your sight reading. So it was always a way to encourage building those musical skills. And you're absolutely right that as a professional choral musician, especially as a choral musician, you have to be looking at the larger score as you sing, and you have to be able to be prepared as you show up. And the biggest example is doing things like movie scores, where you show up and the music is on the stand and they give you the note and you sing it maybe twice and that's it. That's, so that's it really what I was thinking. Down the skills. Yeah, yeah. And I know that um, SAG-AFTRA for a while was actually offering sight reading classes because people wanted to to do studio singing and such, yes. you know, but they didn't have those skills. Yeah. And uh, and they were finding out, oops, you know, I can't just go out there with my lovely voice and sing. Um, so, yeah. And, and with the movie scores, which we'll talk about here for a second, um, that you don't, I think, you know, I, I don't have experience doing that. I have experience doing voiceover for, for things, but not uh, the singing. Uh, well, actually I did, but that's another story. So, <laughs> but um, for these kinds of things, you don't always know what you're going to be, even what, what it is. You just show up and, and they put you on a stand and say, here's your part. And you're singing with other people uh, often, you know, or most of the time, I guess, you know, because it's an ensemble type thing. And, um, and you're off and running and there's no room for, for error. So now what are, will people, uh, I don't know if they'll recognize your voice if you're within the ensemble, unless you had some solo, but um, what, what movie scores have you sung? Well, the very first one I sang was Godzilla. Uh, this is, I don't know how many years ago, but that picture had a massive choir because the, the score was broken into, I think if memory serves, something like 10 or 12 individual lines of vocal music. And so you certainly wouldn't pick me on in a choir that large uh, but then those in fact i've only done things that are large choirs um but the most famous familiar one was the los angeles master chorale was the choir that sang on the last two star wars films which was of course a thrill of a lifetime having you know being a child of the 70s and having john williams actually conducting and in the space you know in in those sessions that was a real treat for me child of the 70s or not that's exciting i mean some of these names you know some of these people who you've worked with um, you know, those are memory book things and those are things that go on, you know, in history and, and you know, generations of your family and, and people will, wow, Matt Tressler sang under John Williams and under Michael Tilson Thomas. So what was that all about? Well, when I was in Miami, uh, Seraphic Fire was performing with the New World Symphony, which is a, a really interesting ensemble in its own. It's a professional level orchestra of players that haven't quite gotten those jobs in the major orchestras, but they're all graduates of conservatory and university programs around the, actually the world. And they perform in Miami and they actually have their own concert hall now. And this is a, a real passion project of Michael Tilson Thomas. And we were performing together with the University of Miami, my last year of my doctorate, the mass in E flat uh, by Schubert. And so I was one of the soloists that sang in that performance. And since I've sung twice in the LA Master Chorale under Michael Tilson Thomas, just a, a, a real treat, you know, of course, one of the, the big um, important conductors of the American tradition, I guess you could say. And he's been such a, uh, an advocate for American music. 
Yes, yes, he has been. And, and he's, you know, he's a complete musician, too. I mean, you have to stand in awe of this person who can hear and play and, and do all the things that he can. Yeah, he's he's uh, many cuts above <laughs> and somebody to really look up to. Um, so now there are many there. What is the Grammy? There was a Grammy that um, I said that... on uh, a CD with Conspirari that was all Russian Orthodox uh, sacred church music. And that won the Grammy for best choral recording in 2016, maybe 2017, somewhere around there. Mm hmm. And and I, I kind of poked around to try to find something, you know, I, I know you've done solo work, um, but a lot most of your stuff is ensemble because you're a choral person and choral is in, in your heart. Yeah. Um, but um, I poked around to try and find some things where I could pick your voice out a little bit. And there was something on a, an album of spirituals where you were one of a okay. few voices. And I think you were doing upper upper tenor parts in that. And and that was quite lovely. That was nice. So is there any um, other solo work or small ensemble work that we can hear you on? Sure. The one that comes to mind is when I was with Seraphic Fire, we sang uh, the Monteverdi Vespers of 1610, and we performed it together with the choir from Western Michigan University and took a tour of, of with that piece to Mexico City, sang it in the cathedral. It was a wonderful time. And that recording of the Monteverdi Vespers, I was the soloist for Nigra Sum, one of the earlier movements. So that's just me and Theorbo. You, you can find that one pretty easy because that that one was number one in the classical charts on iTunes when it came out. It was a also kind of an exciting time for that piece. That was we we performed that in six in 2010, which of course is the 400th anniversary. And that year I performed it in Hawaii, Mexico City, Miami, and New Mexico. I think in that one year, <laughs> but not nearly as many as some other friends of mine. They performed it everywhere because it was the the Monteverdi Vespers year, you know. Yeah, I am so jealous. This is so, so so exciting, all the travel. Now, how has, um, I don't want to really switch gears, but I'm curious because uh, COVID, of course, has impacted everyone. And how has that, have you been doing some online singing? You know, there are these groups or rehearsals or things. How, is, how has COVID affected you? Well, as a performer, as a singer, I, I did a few videos with the LA Master Chorale. They were... Um, Many of these ensembles, of course, want to stay connected with their community, meaning their audience, because that, that idea of audience is not just, you know, people who buy tickets, but it really is your community who, who has its own culture that's shared. And it's really true. Being someone who's sung with several different groups in several different places, there is a different culture. So the Los Angeles Master Crowd, as an example, and there were other groups that were doing this too, they would have groups come together and either record yourself, and then they would have it all put together, or they would have people come together in bubbles, as they called it, and produce videos. Uh, and so I did a couple of those for the Master Crawl, where I recorded them in this very room and sit them in and put it together. Um, aside from that, I didn't really do much singing during that time, which was okay because there was a lot of shifting in my teaching work at that time, you know, which demanded my attention, I guess you'd say, or just my time in the, in the day. Yes, yes, teaching does tend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I, I saw, I think you do some other... Um, I, I guess we can mention this. There was a, a benefit that you recently did for a local theater, for the Chance Theater, oh. uh, a little online. And, and your wife, your wife is a singer as well. That's right. I, I met my wife actually in Seraphic Fire. She's one of the founding members of that group. And then we sang together in Santa Fe for a couple of summers. And and we're now very happily 18 years or eight years married. But I've known her since 2003. So <laughs> I was 18. So She's going to yeah. be saying, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she was a classical ensemble singer like me. And she's sort of shifting these days into exploring musical theater, reconnecting with an earlier passion for her. When she was in school, that's what she really liked. So we did a, a, a little in-home recital for the, our beloved Chance Theater here in, in Orange County. And it was a little hour-long recital where I played and Gabby sang. And we, we set up a camera and filmed it all downstairs. And uh, it, was, it was really fun. It was great for us during that time just to have a project, you know, to be making. I, we're very fortunate that way, too. We could still make music in our house, you know. Yeah, the two of us and, were here. We're both musicians, so. And that's it. I know a lot of us. We were sitting around sometimes just making music for ourselves. You know, just yeah. anything. You know, I've got to do this. I've got to have this. Make this expression. You know. Right. Right. Um, now, is that is that still available to view, or how? I, I don't know. Actually, it was uh, done as a during their chance a thon, as it's called, which historically is something where for twenty. 
I don't know how many hours they just set up the theaters and it's just nonstop performances. But so this was all done online. I'm not sure if that's still available on their site or not, but it was okay. a, a live event. It was literally live on Zoom. We didn't pre-record it. Yeah, so I yeah. think they recorded it for later, but it was it was a live event. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm sure. And and this also when you when you talk about meeting your wife singing, you know, for all people who oh, how do I ever meet anybody? Well, you know, they say, do what you're interested in, do what your love is. And then you'll find people who, you know, who you want to spend time with and sure. and maybe even marry. So <laughs> you're absolutely so, right. Yeah. So so um, that's all wonderful. I'm trying to think um, I'm actually going to look at my notes again. I hate to do that, but I want to make sure we don't miss anything. Um, you know, I had a question about um, about the uh, the reviews, the feathery light acrobatics. So somebody heard you a little solo piece of something that you did or something solo in ensemble. And and uh, tell me, What's well, that, that was Dido and Aeneas um, with the Corona del Mar ba um, Baroque Festival. And so I was singing some sort of a shepherd aria, I think, which just happened to be very light, very, you know, sort of a love song, pastoral something. And so that was that was how that that little quote came about, I think. And, and you know, I wanted to ask you, too, I'm glad that we talked about this for a second, because you sing in a lot of um, early type music ensembles. OK. But, you know, clearly you are a, a wonderful soloist as well. Um, how, how do you deal with, you know, do you sing with other ensembles that are not so much early music because there are different vocal styles? And how do you make that adjustment? Well, one of the things I, I would, would say that I would always tell a student is there are common things among all styles. You still have to sing in tune. You have to be able to sing loud and soft and high and low. And really what it comes down to is, uh, as a, a professional ensemble singer, especially in these early music pieces, because often you step out of an ensemble for the solo movement and back into a small ensemble. So it's that that sort of slight change in giving a little bit more of yourself or giving more of yourself to the others, you know, to the larger sound. And so I think that's probably the biggest difference. But it's true, I do sing with a lot of early music ensembles. I'm singing next week with the Bach Collegium of San Diego. We're, we're doing um, Handel, recording it. So that's all Baroque instruments at Baroque pitch. Um, and then other times we sing new music with other groups, you know, and things with larger orchestras and acapella music and a little bit of everything. Wow, Baroque pitch. What does that do to anybody who has perfect pitch? <laughs> Thankfully, I don't. <laughs> uh, so usually in Baroque pitch, you would be singing instead of at A440, it's 415. So it's basically reading everything a half step down. But I think that we're doing this handle piece at 792. So that one's going to be even more challenging. For wow. The, there, there's a, also a Bach piece on the program, and that's 415. But I think that the, the handle is a little bit different. For me, I just listen for the first pitch and go. <laughs> I'm all about uh, relational tuning, you know, and not the. But, I, but I've sung with singers before where, especially if you're reading something in a clef in, you know, Renaissance music. And in Renaissance music, so much of it is movable tonic anyway. So. They'll say, okay, we're going to do it in this key, which is three steps away from the key that it's written, and it's in a clef, and you watch the people with perfect pitch just, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know it. someone who, I, I'm not going to drop her name because I don't think she would appreciate it, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, some people are very private, but um, but she, if, if something's slightly out of tune and she's looking at the sheet music, you know, if the, if the instruments or if something's out of tune, it's like, she'll just, I can't do this, <laughs> you know, I can't yeah. do this, it, it yeah. needs to be in tune. Um, and oh, there was something else about that. Um, oh, it's so interesting. If anybody has a chance to listen to, and you know, hopefully I can put some information. I'll try to put some graphics up uh, about your concerts. Uh, it, you said there's one coming up. Um, when is that coming up? Um, it's on Saturday night, uh, December 30th. It's oh, at good. All Souls Episcopal Church in Point Loma in San Diego. And I'm not sure of the time off the top okay. of my head. That's all right. I'll try and find some information and put a little graphic up or something okay. um, to, so that people can do that because, and here's why, if, you know, I, I know I've listened to, um, I think it's Philharmonia Baroque, an orchestra mm -hmm. that, that plays with the, some period instruments and, you know, weird things <laughs> in, 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 in the, uh, in the reduced pitch, you know, and it's, there's something about it that's relaxing and it really is a treat to the ear to hear this and and again that's that living history thing to know that what you're hearing is as close as we can tell because we really don't know what went on centuries ago yeah you know that, there, that's a, that's another exciting thing about being a singer in this time is since the 1970s we've had this 
huge movement in early music where they play on period instruments. Instead of steel strings, they're gut strings and they use the smaller Baroque bows and the trumpets don't have valves and everything is slightly different tuning. And so, as you said, we won't know until they invent time travel exactly what it sounded <laughs> like. But our understanding continues to deepen because of all the time that has been spent over the last you know, 50 years with people reading the the period, you know, primary sources, what, what they, how they taught and, and what they thought and looking at the music and now that they've used these instruments for 50 years, learning how the music fits those instruments. And it really has informed our, our sort of sound world. And it's it really is thrilling to hear a period group. I highly recommend it. Musical Angelica right here in Los Angeles, the Bach Collegium in San Diego, Philharmonia up in the Bay Area, as you say, in California, there's a lot of it going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and people just, even if they're not inclined, it's like I'm learning a lot um, recently uh, about sports. <laughs> And I have spent no time with sports, you know, but uh -huh. I'm kind of getting into it. You know, I was always a little bit, oh, football, baseball, you know, but but if music and this kind of music has not been your thing, I would say get out there and try it because it might be, you know, it might be something really good for you. You might enjoy it. I, I, I absolutely agree, Patricia. And I would just add to that. If if you haven't been out to see live music, take advantage of it. If you happen to be local here in Southern California, because we just it's an embarrassment of riches. The music that is in the colleges and the universities and the, the community ensembles, the level of professional music, the touring things that come through, just a wealth you know, of live music, which, of course, no matter how good the stereo system, you can't recreate that experience of live people making live music. So Yeah, of all advantage. kinds. And, and here, just to, not, to do a further commercial for Southern California, we have uh, the, um, the uh, Sigurstrom, you know, in the, uh, the, the Arts Center there in Orange County. We have, um, you know, the Barclay. We have uh, Soka that has Soka University that brings in some wonderful programs and all the colleges. I've been listening to some college concerts and I, you know, I'm going to do it again. Hearing live music. I heard a college live orchestra, the first violin. I started crying. <laughs> live music again, you know, um, it's it's important. It's, it's true. And, and I understand that sort of first taste after that time away. My wife and I saw Hamilton the night before last and the, oh, nice. being back in a theater and seeing the same thing, just a little misty, you know, that's, <laughs> this is happening and I'm here. You know? Yes, yeah. yes, I made it through. Yes, I made it yeah, through yeah. a year and, and a half. And we're all here. And we're making music on the other side, you know, yeah, Hopefully, yeah. the other side. Yeah, I know. Or wherever we are near the end <laughs> or in the middle um, yeah. with our fingers crossed. Yes. Um, now, before before we uh, close, and I'd love to have you back again for for another segment. So, uh, yeah. Um, but before we finish talking about your illustrious career, and it is, um, which continues, and you're so young too. Oh my goodness, you have so much time ahead of you. Um, um, before we finish with that, for singers who might be inclined to embark on such a career, um, you know, I'm letting you mull this over while I sit here and trip over myself. Um, is there anything in particular you would encourage them to do um, to to prepare? Uh, well, there's I, I suppose two things spring to mind. One is to work on those um, literacy skills, basic fundamental literacy of how to read music and how to read it quickly. Uh, and as a singer, uh, familiarity with languages in, in the choral world, you have to have you. I, I only am fluent in English, but you have to be familiar enough to read these languages. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, sort of that personal responsibility of just sort of taking care of business and how you how you take care of your own business, because uh, being an individual singer, not, you know, sort of the ensemble itself, but as an individual who works for many ensembles, a lot of it also comes down to what kind of a colleague you are. You know, will you be prepared? Are you a good colleague to other singers? You know, and that idea, again, of giving yourself to the larger group. Um, becomes important. So those would be the two biggest things, the way you take care of business and your own personal skill set. Right, right. And be, show up, be on time. Don't don't miss anything. With a pencil. And, <laughs> yep, with pencil. Pencils, yeah. everybody, you know, and, and whatever other accoutrements you might need. Um, but um, yes. Well, this is just fantastic. You've made my day. Oh, thank you. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> been nice and, to chat uh, with you. Oh, and and uh, so we will we will have you back for another right. segment and maybe right. we'll talk a little bit about your your teaching and, and okay. I'd education. Love to. OK, super. Thanks so much. Thank you, Patricia. And everybody, thank you very much for watching Studio Shank Sundays live at five and keep watching and please subscribe and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.